So hello everyone, welcome to this uh, Men of Mice webinar. This is Peter Peterson uh, speaking and with me I have Karsten Strootman uh, who will do the presentation or deliver the webinar here today. I would like to remind everyone that uh, we are recording this uh, webinar and uh, once the webinar is done we will soon find the recording at our website and you'll find recordings from our previous sessions as well there. Now uh, today's webinar is focused on DNSSEC and DNSSEC monitoring uh, strategy and tools, how to monitor uh, these services. And uh, uh, so uh, I would like to remind you that you can submit your questions at any time uh, through this webinar, through the GoToMeeting uh, control panel, and we will address these questions toward the end of the webinar. Now, uh, Karsten, uh, the audience is yours. Thank you, Peter. Hello and welcome to our webinar today for um, about DNS and DNSSEC monitoring. Now, the aim of this webinar is to give you a toolbox for your own DNS and DNSSEC monitoring. I will not talk about products, at least uh, not uh, most time. Instead, uh, we have prepared a set of uh, 15 essential um, uh, queries that can be used to, to monitor. But first, why should we do DNSSEC monitoring? Now, compared with the traditional DNS infrastructure, if you add DNSSEC to the game, the infrastructure becomes more fragile. Uh, this is because the configuration is more complex, but also that if DNSSEC is enabled, most errors can be or are fatal. That is, the zone cannot be resolved anymore. And that is actually a feature of DNSSEC. Uh, the reason here being that if the DNS data that is being returned by the DNS servers is not 100% correct and matches the digital signatures, it uh, looks like an attack and a validating resolver will not use that data. And that is actually what we want from DNSSEC. That also implies that the administrators of the DNS servers must work much more carefully when um, configuring and operating a DNSSEC signed zone. Now, and monitoring helps to detect issues before <clears throat> your DNS service is affected. So before your clients and customers uh, find out that your web page isn't functioning anymore. So, <clears throat> we have compiled 15 monitoring scripts, and these are simple Unix-style scripts that should work on any Unix and Linux system. And they should also work on Windows 10 if you install the new Linux subsystem there, or on an older Windows system if you install the SIGWIN uh, system. They are simple enough that someone who knows about PowerShell can probably rewrite these shell scripts in PowerShell and uh, run them on any Windows system. We make all these scripts available on GitHub under an open source BSD2 clause license. So you can take them and do whatever you want with them. Uh, just uh, you can put them into your uh, monitoring system, no matter what monitoring system that is, because most monitoring systems that I know can execute some shell scripts and, and, and read the output out there. However, we would really, really welcome your feedback. And if you want to make changes or you've made changes to the scripts or you even make additions or new scripts, you can send us these additions and fixes through a pull request on GitHub. Now, if you ever worked with Git and GitHub, you might know how that works. If you don't, you can ask us. Uh, send us feedback and question to support at minimize.com and we will try to help you there. <clears throat> So the scripts are deliberately simple. They are as simple that each test fits on one slide. So it, it is made that way that even a, a DNS administrator, which is not a scripting wizard, should be able to understand how the script works, what it does, and how to implement and uh, maybe adjust the script to its own needs. Each script takes just one input parameter, which is the domain name of a delegated zone. So if uh, you have a domain in the internet, that's the name that you uh, give the script on the uh, command line. And you can use the scripts from a cron job, 
like write a, a simple wrapper script that calls all the tests out of the 15 that you would like to run periodically for your domains. And you catch then from the cron job the output in, a, in an email and uh, have the email sent to your email account. And then you get, if you like run the cron job every 24 hours, every morning you get a nice report on uh, the health of your domains. But of course you can also embed the scripts into any monitoring system, Zabbix or uh, whatever monitoring system you run. First, we start with the DNS server tests. The first test tests if the DNS servers, the authoritative ones for the zones, are available over UTP v4. For that, the script iterates over all the servers listed in the NS records of the zone and sends a request for the SOA record to um, every authoritative server that is listed in the NS records. Let's see how this test works for the metamice.com domain. So here we see all the servers have been queried and they all respond. The second test is very, very similar, but instead of IPv4, it tests UDPv6. So let's check if that also works. And I'm taking different domain here, dnsworkshop.org. dnsworkshop.org just has two name servers that are reachable over IPv6 and we see them here. They both respond. Now that we have tested UDP connectivity both for IPv4 and IPv6, we can do the same for TCP. Now remember that the DNS protocol sometimes switches over to TCP. That happens, for example, if a DNS server needs to answer a query and the answer is too large to fit into a UDP answer packet. This can either happen with classical DNS, if the answer is larger than 512 byte, or in modern DNS with eDNS0, if the answer is larger than the eDNS buffer size or is larger than 4K. So it's important that every DNS server is um, also responding on, um, on TCP. Now let's check the man and mice domain with test number three. And yes, it works. So we get a, a TCP response from all the six servers in um, the man and mice domain. Now I'm using a domain which doesn't support uh, TCP. And here the first server is queried. And the test will run on a timeout and will, turn, will return an error. The scripts return both an error message and a return code greater than zero indicating that something is wrong. So if you um, integrate the scripts into your monitoring systems. You can just look at the return codes of the scripts and act accordingly. If the return code is zero, everything is good. If the return code is larger than zero, something happened here. And on this script we have a return code of nine, which is larger than zero, meaning something got wrong. Test number four tests also TCP, but this time it's TCP over IPv6. For dnsworkshop.org, also both servers just answer fine over IPv6. Now these first four tests were very basic. The next test tests for the eDNS response size. Modern servers support the extended DNS version 0 extensions. And with this extension, UDP can deliver answers up to 4K. 
However, currently in the internet, there is a practical limit of 1232 bytes. This is because in the internet we want to prevent IPv6 fragmentation from happening. And 1232 byte is the guaranteed payload that will never be fragmented when sent over IPv6. So we edit in the script our EDNS policy, that is the value that we want to see from our servers. And the script will test whatever the server is indicating. The purpose of this test is to figure out that our servers are really responding how they should be and so that we can catch any regressions maybe that happen through an update. So first I'm testing the manamize.com domain and all the manamize.com servers are responding with an EDNS zero buffer size of 4000 96k, uh, uh, sorry, 4096 bytes, which is the default for EDNS0, but it's too high for IPv6. Let's test the ic.org. We see also there is 4096 bytes. For dnsworkshop.org, we have lower values. And the server ns4 tidelock.de has a buffer size of exactly 1032, which is detected as good here. And the other one, the ns5, has an even lower buffer size of 1220, which is out of the policy range of this test. Be aware that you should adapt this test and this script for your needs and your own configurations. So. Um, change the policy value to whatever value you have configured on your DNS servers. These first five tests were about the um, DNS server. The next test tests the DNS zone data. The first zone test tests if all the authoritative servers for a zone respond. This is counted against the number of delegation authoritative servers in the zone. For the domain minimize.com, all authoritative servers answer. I'm testing here another domain which is GNU.org, and they have a lameness issue, meaning that for GNU.org there is delegation in the org domain pointing to some servers which are not answering, and that is a bad situation. And we see that here in the output of the script we have a mismatch. We have four servers in the delegation and only three of the four servers are answering. Test number seven, test if all the authoritative servers for a zone respond via TCP. This is very similar to test number six, but just instead of UDP, it tests with TCP. And for manamize.com, everything is good. And for gnu.org, we would see the same issue. Sometimes if there's a misconfiguration in some firewall, we would see that UDP is going through, but TCP is being blocked. And test number seven would detect this. Test number eight tests whether all the authoritative servers have the same SOAR serial number. This is important to detect zone transfer issues. However, it is permitted that the source serial number is different for a short amount of time. For example, if just the master server has been updated and the zone transfer does not just happen to the slaves. So in order to build this test into a monitoring system, you should test with this test every five minutes. 
And the test should issue a warning if the same SOA difference is seen in two successive tests. If then the same SOA difference is also seen after three or more tests, an event of an error event should be generated. This is the script that tests for the SOA record. It iterates over all the authoritative servers, collects the SOA serial number, and compares it to the other values. Let's test this for the minimize.com domain. Here we see that all the servers for the minimize.com domain have the same SOA serial number. Doing the same test for the DNS workshop. And we see here all the servers for DNS workshop also have the same serial number. Test number nine tests for the AA flag, the authoritative answer flag. Every server that is listed in delegation for a zone should be authoritative for the zone. And that is tested with uh, checking for the AA flag, which denotes if the server is answering authoritatively. Sometimes, especially with the use of load balances in front of DNS servers, this is not the case. And this would be a protocol error. It might work if the service doesn't respond with quad A, uh, sorry, with uh, double A, with the AA flag, but in some situations DNS resolution could fail, especially with um, DNSSEC. Now let's see how DNS, uh, how the test number nine looks like. So for dnsworkshop.org, everything is fine. We have an AA flag found. Everything is good for both servers that is in the delegation. For minimize.com, also the AA flag is found, is found on all the servers. For outlook.com, Everything is good as well. As well as for Microsoft.com. Test number 10 looks for the parent-child NS record set. Uh, the NS records that are used in delegation in the parent zone should always match the NS records used in the zone data. And this script of test number 10 will first collect the NS records from one of the authoritative servers for the top level domain, which is the parent of the zone. And then it will compare that data with the uh, NS records that are stored in the zone. Now this test, for simplicity reasons, um, works only if the parent domain is a top-level domain. However, it should be rather trivial to adapt this script to work on third-level and uh, other domains which are below the top-level. Let's uh, see how test number 10 works for DNS Workshop. And here we have the parent delegation lists the NS4 tide lock and NS5 tide lock, and the child zone data has the same information. The domain, the domain GNU.org has a mismatch. <coughs> For GNU.org, the parent delegation lists the NS1 and NS2 and NS3 GNU.org, but the child contains one more server, the NS4 GNU.org. 
And as for GNU.org, is also the machine that is lame. It doesn't answer anymore. So here we have a classical parent-child NS resource record set mismatch. The last five tests are DNSSEC specific. Test number 11 tests for the uh, DNS key resource record size. The full answer package of a DNS key, DNS key resource record site should be below the IPv6 fragmentation payload limit, which is 1232 byte. So this script will request the, all the DNS key records from a DNS 69 zone and then will check for the size of these records. So if we check ic.org, we see that the DNS key resource record size is 923 byte, which is below the threshold. And for dnsworkshop.org, because it is signed with uh, a large key, the DNS key resource record side size is uh, too large at least too large for um, IPv6 fragmentation. It's 1,283. Test number 12 checks for the validity of the signatures. In DNSSEC, DNSSEC signatures have a lifetime. They have a starting date and an end date, an expiry date. This test should be performed for every important resource record set into zone. The script that we have here as an example makes a test for the SOAR record, but you should adapt the script also to do the same test for DNS key, MX records, and all the A and quad A records in your, um, in your zone. From testing the R6, there can be four different failure states. It is an error if the inception time is in the future, meaning that the signature is not yet valid. This is because most uh, automatic signers, they, when, if they create signatures, these signatures start uh, one or two hours in the past. It is also an, issue, uh, an error if the expiry time is in the past, meaning that the signatures are already expired. A warning, sh a warning should be given if the expire will be reached in less than five days, because usually that means that the automatic re-signing of the zone is broken. And it's an error when the if the expire time is reached in less than two days, because then the administrator should act immediately because there's danger that the zone goes bogus, meaning that the zone data cannot be resolved anymore. So this is the script. It first looks for the current date and converts it into the same format as used by the signatures. And then it requests the uh, signature for the SOAR record and cuts out the inception time and the expiry time. And then it compares these times to the current timestamp. And then it does some calculation to shift the um, current time two days ahead and five days ahead and tests against the expiry. Now for dnsworkshop.org, um, the inception is in the past, that was um, in, um, on the 8th of uh, November, uh, the signature got, the signature got uh, created and the expiry is in December. Because we have uh, 9th of uh, November, the signature is good. If 
I do the same test for ic.org. We see also everything is fine. Uh, today's timestamp is in between inception and expiry time. I have a domain which is called fail02 dnsec.works, which has expired signatures uh, for the purpose of uh, troubleshooting or uh, learning how to troubleshoot. And if we send a query to, uh, or if we use test 12 on this domain, we get an error and uh, the ROSIC validity. Uh, is in the past. Exactly the signatures here have been expired in uh, May 1983, so a long, long time ago. The script will detect this and will issue uh, an error message. Test number 13 tests the DS record. It tests the number and the contents of the DS record of the parent zone. And it is used a warning if the count or the content of the DS record changes. This is important to detect unauthorized changes to the zone uh, or even um, the removal of DNSSEC from a zone. For this, the script will store the content and the number of DS records from previous tests and will compare the current test with the data from the previous tests. On the first invocation of this test, uh, an error is given and that is expected because no previous data has been stored and there is nothing to compare against. So test 13 for dnsworkshop.org. Here I get these error messages because the um, files with the saved content were not available. So I get a warning that the DS record has changed. But now on the second invocation, everything is okay because the DS record is the same as last time tested and the number of DS record is also the same. So we get now an okay unless the DS record will change. In which case we get a warning message again and an error code. Test number 14 checks that the key tag uh, in the DS record matches the key tag on the key signing key. Because the DS record is the hash of the current active key signing key in the zone, the key tags of the DS record and the key signing key should always match. Now it's not directly possible to read the key tag from the uh, dig output, at least not with every version of dig. So we retrieve the key ID indirectly by looking at the signature of the DNS key record set. The DNS key record set in a zone should always be signed by the key signing key. And then the key tag will appear in the signature. So the script is comparing the key tag of the DS record with the key tag that appears in the signature of the DNS key resource record set. If they are identical, everything is good and no error is being given out. Uh, if they are different, we get an error message and, a, and, a, and a, an error return code. For ic.org everything is okay. Key tag matches the key tag of the RSIC on the DNS key and also DNS workshop should be good. And the last test counts the DNS key resource records in the zone. This number will change during a key rollover. Having a change in the DNS key resource record set is not an error. But it is a condition that you want to monitor because you want to know whether you are 
automatic key rollovers work and whether they succeed. Meaning that when the key rollover has finished, the number of DNS key resource records go back to a normal count. Usually two or three, depending whether you have an emergency rollover key or not. Again, this script creates a save file and on the first invocation it will always give an error. But on all subsequent um, invocations it should be just good. So on first invocation I get this error message but then on all other invocations um, I get the information that the number of DNS key resources are like the same as with the previous tests. So these were the 15 scripts that uh, we have prepared. Some tips in using them. Um, if you use a DNSSEC monitoring system, it would be good if this monitoring system could also write an audit trail of your DNSSEC zone changes, especially changes to the DNS key resource record, meaning the key ID and the source serial number uh, changes. And uh, change that, uh, uh, save that to a file, and that file should always be appended, and you want to have the uh, date and time when the change is being detected. With that, you always know when um, a key rollover happened and at what point of time uh, a new key was introduced in the system and the old key is removed. And you should do the same for the DS record. Uh, usually the DS record will change a little bit later than the DNS key record because the first new DNS keys will be brought into a zone. Uh, the publish time um, to wait until the new DNS key record is in all the caches and then the DS record will be exchanged in the parent zone. You also want to have the key ID of the DS record and the source serial number of the parent zone uh, stored in that uh, audit trail. Of course there are open source products that do the same or even more than I've shown here. There is the DNSSEC tools from the Swedish top-level domain. You can also find uh, that on GitHub. It's open source. Uh, VeriSign, the people who run the root name server system, or some of the root name servers at least, and uh, COM and uh, NET, they have the JDNSSEC tools written in, in Java. And they also have the yet another zone validation script, um, which you see below. Also two open source uh, solutions. Then the LDNS uh, package has LDNS Verify that can be used to uh, verify a DNSSEC sign zone. Um, with that you can uh, use DIG to, to download a zone to, um, to a file and then run LDNS Verify on that zone and it will report something like uh, uh, signatures that are invalid. And then there is a, a Nagios plugin. If you run uh, Nagios as your um, monitoring tool that is also available on GitHub and it is written by uh, um, our trainer colleagues Jan Piet Mens. And then we have Key Checker which is a monitoring tool especially for key rollovers uh, and that Key Checker writes this um, audit trail of um, key IDs in for the DNS keys and the DS records also available on GitHub. And then two external tools or websites that uh, you can use for DNSSEC monitoring. There's Zone Master, which is a collaboration of the French top-level domain registry uh, and um, the Swedish uh, top-level domain registry .se. Uh, it's called Zone Master, and you find that on zonemaster.net. And uh, also very helpful is DNSVis, uh, which is uh, done by a company called Zandia in the US and uh, DNSWIS uh, analyzes all the uh, DNSSEC data and uh, displays nice uh, graphics, graphs on the trust chain and delegation chain in DNS and will pinpoint any problems that uh, they see. So this concludes the webinar today. Um, we have some trainings coming up. 
the last DNS and bind training uh, in the US this year is on uh, November, that is uh, next week, November 7th to 11th uh, in Redwood City, California. Um, there are still seats open uh, and uh, this training is being confirmed, so if you um, want to hop on the train at the last minute, please let us know. Go to the website that is shown here, uh, memmice.com supports dash training slash training, and you can still register and come to Redwood City. Uh, the training will take place in the offices of IEC, uh, so the people who run and uh, do the bind name server and also run part of the uh, root name server system. It's also a nice environment to ju just say hi to the people at ISC uh, there and, and learn about BIND and uh, the work they do. And our next webinar will be in December. Where we'll, we'll talk about uh, DNS high availability tools, open source load balancing, and especially there we'll uh, talk about how DNS clients of popular operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Linux, how they choose the DNS resolver amongst a list of available servers and how you can use open source tools like DNS Dist, uh, which is from PowerDNS or RelayD, which is from OpenBSD. We can use that to make DNS resolving more resilient. So you don't need to buy expensive commercial load balancers, of course you could, but we show you how you can use open source tools to do almost the same. That concludes my uh, webinar or our webinar for today. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Karsten. Uh, no, I don't see any questions right now, but uh, uh, you can still write your questions to the GoToMeeting control panel. So, Karsten, it's a uh, new ground uh, for most of us uh, to monitor and analyze the DNSX setup, so this is really uh, useful. Yeah, I expect uh, more DNSSEC in the future. Just today I've learned that NIST, the uh, American National Institute for Standards, that they are issuing um, a paper that uh, describes secure email and that uh, seems to mandate uh, the use of DNSSEC and DANE. That is, and might, yes, that is interesting to say the least. Yeah, and that might be that certain uh, U.S. Uh, organizations, government organizations, or even enterprises uh, are um, recommended in the future to use DNS second day. Very good, Karsten. So uh, I've got one question, if the slides and scripts will be available for download. And, uh, uh, well, I can answer the first part at least, that... Uh, the slides and the recording of this webinar will be uh, available through our website within a few days. Uh, how about the scripts, Karsten? You, I think you mentioned they, these were found online as well. Yes, they are already uploaded to GitHub uh, and they will be expanded over the um, next days. I've just written them uh, yesterday and um, I will do more extensive tests on Linux and will upload the fixes uh, either tomorrow or on the weekend and uh, you can find them there and, and download them. Um, also, if, if you are a scripting wizard out there uh, and you would like to help in expanding and uh, making the scripts better, please do and send us a pull request. That is what GitHub is good for. Excellent. So, Karsten, uh, I don't see any further questions from the audience right now, so uh, uh, unless uh, you have uh, any further to say, I think we'll... Uh, put an end to this webinar. Now I wish everyone a, a very nice uh, November time and uh, see and hear you in December to our next webinar. Thank you, Karsten, and thank you everyone, and have a nice day. Bye. Bye for now. Ciao, ciao.